two more questions and then ask you to play a song. Um, when, when, when an audience comes to a show, they put down their money, and, and they're, they're coming and they, they have certain expectations, um, and, and they're legitimate in expectations that the artist is going to be fully present, is, is, is going to be ready to play. Mm -hmm. What's the responsibility of the audience? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but this is yeah. Don't, don't take this shot hard too seriously because it that I, that that's how I used to feel in the beginning because I was terrified of audiences and um, the only way I could deal was just to like, try to pretend that they weren't there. Mm -hmm. But over the years, that sort of evolved into uh, a feeling that that the shows we're all sharing this experience together. You know, I happen to be the center of attention, or the songs are. I don't songs. Um, the songs are a vehicle for me to share my existence with whoever wants to listen. And uh, yeah, we don't want disruptions, nobody does, but uh, but interaction is good mm -hmm. at this point. And, and uh, the feeling that there is a sense of exchange going on is a good thing. Yeah, a sense that um, you are weaving a world and you're inviting into it and they enter it. And hopefully they'll recognize them. Yeah. You know, as, as, as a world that they also live in. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, it, it, without that, I think it would be pretty dry. Mm -hmm. But um, because the basic ingredients of all our lives are pretty similar, um, you know, we all, well, it's obvious anyway, but, but uh, um, that there's good reason to suspect that find something to relate to in the songs. And in the music, I mean, you know, when it's just music and not words, then you can float away on that and it's great too. I mean, that's one of the wonderful things about pure music. Right, right. Uh, I do want to ask a musical question. Um, in, in a number of your instrumental pieces and, and some of your vocal pieces recently, uh, there, there's a, a an embrace of atonality, it seems. And I'm, I'm just wondering about you know, your, your Berkeley School uh, days, or who, who were some of your musical influences? <laughs> you know, we know about the Mississippi Yonder uh, on those folks, but in, in let's say that, that art music world. Yeah, my dad, had, you know, when I was in high school, I remember my dad at the dinner table one time referring to me. There's this tone deaf hero, Stravinsky. <laughs> <laughs> He didn't get that kind of music at all. And, and, and yet, I mean, he liked to play your classic stuff or, or older classic yeah. stuff that, that had more geometry to it or a different kind of geometry. But the, the, uh, that modernism had an effect on me when I discovered it. Partly because it just was edgy and it, and you, it kind of gave you a little bit of a chance to thumb your nose at people who didn't get it. Right. But, but all of it, I mean, maybe that was the initial attraction, I'm not sure. But Kind of like drinking your vodka straight when you're 17. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you can't, you know, I don't have to put that in any song right, or whatever. Or, you know, I can just drink it. <laughs> but, but, so I may, I may have kind of started with, the, with that kind of music from the same motivation, but uh, especially at music school, we, we were studying not that kind of stuff. I mean, the essence of what I was being taught there was how to write arrangements for the Benny Goodman Orchestra. Uh, I mean, that style of music, that's where we started. It would have gone on from there if I'd stayed longer. But, um, but at the same time, we were all aware of, of where you can go with this body of theory and what, what had been done. And I actually got to see Stravinsky do that in the <coughs> And it was stunning. Mm -hmm. And uh, it went along with also being able to go to a, the, the jazz club on, a, on an all ages day. And, see Coltrane play and, and uh, all that music went together for me. Right. And the musicians that I was hanging around, the students that I ended up socializing with, were all interested in, in the most expanded horizons that they could come by as well. And that, that sort of gave me uh, a little nudge in the direction too. Okay, last, last question. Um, I dedicated my book to my children, 
with, with these words, with pain, the world pains us over. Lord, let us not betray. God bless the children with vision of the day. Um, what is that betrayal? How do you betray it? I think when I wrote that, I had no idea. I, mean, just, I just knew that you could. <laughs> and then, that, I mean, there's a you know, all sorts of obvious biblical associations and stuff like that and that were, that were certainly in my mind at the time. But um, I think what can be betrayed is that relationship with the divine. I, 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 I think you can, you can turn your back on love and you can, it, it's going to run over you, but you can just turn, <coughs> pretend it's not there. Uh, it, it's, you can, there's all kinds of things all kinds of terrible choices that we can make sometimes for reasons that look like really worthwhile reasons. Um, and sometimes the choices look worthwhile too. And end up not being, but um, that's, uh, I, that's, I suppose, what I'm thinking of in betrayal. Betrayal is the trust that's given us that we're going to see that relationship. And, so, and somehow the children. God bless the well, they're, yeah, they're, they're everybody's second chance. I mean, this is, this is, this is part of the mythology because they, they are part of that, their own thing. But you can look at that innocent baby and then, then you know, see the potential that hasn't been lost yet or hasn't been jeopardized even from, from most kids in, in our part of the world. Yeah, there are there's a lot of other kids that maybe you have to worry about that from the get-go, but, but, uh, there's that, there's like the, the risk of quoting myself. <laughs> uh, the future all the future shining and babies as we are allowed to do that. It, it, but but the, the, the line from Cry of a Tiny Baby, the Christmas song that I wrote, and, and it's the, there's a future shining in a baby's eyes, and it isn't just my ability to project my own ego into the future. It's, it's that this is potential for this one not to be screwed up. <laughs> yeah.